So, welcome to this lecture on community acquired pneumonia. A very common problem faced by all of us, whether we are intensivists or physicians or pulmonologists or you know, even a nephrologist or cardiologist. This is a very common problem and uh, in this we will try to take a case of CAP as an example and go through the guidelines, the treatment, etc. for community acquired pneumonia and this will be regarding community acquired pneumonia requiring ICU admission but not requiring ventilation. So you can see the contents also and uh, we shall now proceed. So as far as the history of pneumonia is concerned, as early as 400 BC, Hippocrates had described pneumonia. And uh, you can see here, para pneumonia and pleuritic affections are thus to be observed if the fever be acute and if there be pains on either side and if there is expiration which is prolonged with cough and sputa etc etc. So they recognize this syndrome of pneumonia and whosoever got pneumonia and by and large died because there was no treatment. Then Sir William Osler, so called father of modern medicine, 100 years ago, linked this pneumonia to a bacterial cause, and subsequently, with the advent of antibiotics, we have some form of treatment now. And the Spanish flu, when it occurred, was a mystery as far as the organism is concerned. It was not known that it was actually caused by a virus or whatever was causing it, whether it was a bacteria or virus. It was only around 30 years later that from the preserved samples they discovered that it was the influenza virus which had killed so many. So pneumonia has been called captain of death by none other than William Osler and especially in the elderly it is the harbinger of death and is the leading cause of mortality amongst all age groups. So we come to this case, it's a simple case but often we bungle up simple cases and end up with ventilating these patients. So we should get simple things straight and of course complicated patients can then follow. So this is a patient uh, with uh, fever for three days, he's, it's not recorded and he's 50 years old, he presents with grade 2 dyspnea, that is mild dyspnea, he lives in the city and works in an office and there is no past history of any kind, there is no exposure to animals, birds, he's not immunocompromised and there is no similar illness in the family. He has taken augmented, that is a mox clap for one day. So this kind of history should be taken for all patients and we shall see what is the relevance of all this uh, because this actually gives a clue to the etiology. And on examination, uh, GCS is 15 and all vitals are stable except for a saturation of 92% requiring low flow oxygen on nasal prongs and few bilateral crepes. So this is the x-ray which was done outside when he presented to us and uh, what you can see with the arrows are actually called air bronchograms. And uh, these air bronchograms are seen in conditions where there is edema or there is inflammatory fluid or there is blood 
surrounding the bronchi. The bronchi are normally surrounded by the alveoli which contain black air. So there is no real contrast but when the alveoli get filled with like I said edema or inflammatory fluid or blood then the alveoli become white and the air in the bronchi remains black so it is contrasted as you can see here. So this here is black and surrounding area is white so the black is the air in the bronchi and this is an air bronchogram similarly here and in other places also for example here. So one has to look for the air bronchogram and uh, when you get an air bronchogram it means generally it's a pneumonia. However, it can also occur in pulmonary edema due to cardiac causes or in pulmonary hemorrhage. But generally it is pneumonia. However, it is not always pneumonia like I just said. And there are other chronic pulmonary conditions which can also cause air bronchograms. But in the acute setting, this is the differential for air bronchograms. It is not that if you do not have air bronchograms, you cannot have pneumonia. But you have them, then this is the differential. So this patient had a TLC of 7000 with a normal differential. It is important to look at the differential also. Often we just focus on the TLC. So why is it important to look at the differential? I'll give you an example. Supposing the eosinophilia is around uh, 1500 or 2000 absolute eosinophil count. That is the eosinophils are increased in the differential. That would lead us to a different etiology. For example, acute eosinophilic pneumonia or maybe even worm infestation which can lead to bilateral infiltrates and hypoxia or if there is a lymphocytosis then it, you can think of leukemia that patient has leukemia and probably he's got an infection in the setting of a leukemia so all this is a pointer towards what's happening to the patient what kind of treatment you are going to do and what investigations you are going to send so here in our patient even the TLC is normal and practically Everything is normal. He has a respiratory alkalosis because he's got tachypnea. He's washing out his PCO2 and the Procal is 0.5. So the relevance of Procal in pneumonia is not to establish the diagnosis, but it is helpful to a certain extent to distinguish viral pneumonias from bacterial pneumonias. If your Procal is near normal, then it's more likely to be viral than bacterial and this is only a soft pointer and it has to be taken in conjunction with the other features. Now most important here is echo is normal. So when the echo is normal it rules out cardiac pulmonary edema or acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. When you look at the echo report then please ensure that you look at the diastolic function. Or if you are doing the echo, then you should make sure that you assess the diastolic function because one third of all acute heart failure is diastolic in origin. So even if the EF is normal, your valves are normal, you have to rule out diastolic uh, dysfunction. So here the diastolic function was normal. So we have ruled out acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that leaves us with pneumonia and hemorrhage. So if there was hemorrhage then probably he would have had some hemoptysis, hemoglobin would have been lower and there would be something which would cause pulmonary hemorrhage. So there is no evidence of coagulopathy and if it was a vasculitis then it is unlikely to present with just two or three days of history and more importantly the urine would be active. There would be an active urine sediment because normally 
pulmonary hemorrhage is associated with <coughs> glomerulonephritis. Uh, it's normally a renal pulmonary involvement. So most likely we are dealing with a pneumonia. Now, as far as the differential diagnosis for pneumonia is concerned, I've already talked about uh, ACP and hemorrhage. Then atelectasis can be there sometimes. Aspiration is very common. Then all these other differentials. Now, as far as the other differentials are concerned, for example, eosinophilic pneumonia and boop and vasculitis and uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, they are not actually called ARDS. You know, they are not called ARDS. And uh, the definition of ARDS does not actually take into consideration the etiology. You, we all know the parameters which are involved in diagnosing ARDS. And there is no etiology. But all these conditions listed below can cause <coughs> ARDS as far as the definition of ARDS is concerned. But they are not called ARDS causing diseases, rather they are called ARDS mimickers. So why is there a difference? The answer is the difference lies in the histopathology. ARDS characteristically has diffuse alveolar damage on histopath, that is DAD or dad and these conditions which are ARDS mimickers do not have dad on histopathology. So this is a gray area in the diagnosis and the definition of ARDS. Now we made a clinical diagnosis of CAP and the patient was started on piperacillin tazobectum and Oseltamivir. Because influenza is non-seasonal now, it is very well recognized, we cannot be sure that the patient does not have influenza and uh, we have sent the PCR in the nasal swab and we are awaiting the results but we have to start Oseltamivir also. As far as the choice of piperacillin tazobactam is concerned, that depends on what bugs you are getting from the community in the patients who are coming with pneumonia to your ICU. It is very variable. So piperacillin tazobactam may work, may not work depending on your ICU. You may have to go with carbapenem or maybe even septazidim avibactam if you are working in a referral center and uh, if you are working in areas where there is low resistance, then probably amoxicillin clavulinic acid will also do or ciproxone. So as far as the etiology of pneumonia is concerned, number one bacteria, number two viruses, number three aspiration and sometimes fungi. And there are other pathogens uh, which are very common. Uh, that is malaria, scrub typhus, enteric fever, tuberculosis and so on so forth. But the other pathogens which I have listed are a small fraction but definitely they are there and we miss them sometimes. There are almost 100 pathogens which can cause pneumonia from the community but again foremost is bacteria and 20% of CAP in the ICU is well recognized now to be due to different viruses, not just influenza and COVID now, but there are many viruses as we shall see. And then aspiration is a distinct subset, especially in the elderly because uh, their reflexes are impaired generally or even in alcoholics because they drink, they get drunk, they vomit and they aspirate. And fungi cannot be discounted even in normal people, sometimes you can get fungal pneumonias, for example, cryptococcus, then histoplasmosis, aspergillosis. They can all cause pneumonia, even in the healthy, from the community every now and then. 
Then, as far as the bacterial etiology is concerned, the commonest organism is pneumococcus. I'm sure you're aware of that. And then there is H flu, and 5% of CAP in healthy adults. Mind you, we are restricting ourselves to healthy adults who are not immunocompromised because pneumonia and immunocompromised is a separate lecture by itself. So, gram negative and staph aureus is 5%. Then, as far as atypical pneumonia is concerned, leading amongst them is mycoplasma, then legionella, chlamydia, and chlamydia cyticae, which comes from parrots and birds. And legionella is transmitted from uh, water sources, often from air conditioners. And mycoplasma is uh, droplet transmission from another infected person. So, mycoplasma is a very important organism, and legionella is again very important. And of course, there are other organisms also. Now, we were talking about the history taking, so we shall just focus a little here. Clinical clues to etiology. It's very important to try and establish the etiology with your history and examination. And uh, for the history, I already told you what is to be covered. And this slide shows you the relevance of the history taking. We'll start with elderly impaired swallowing patients. They have gram negative mode and anaerobic mode. Then COPD, lung disease can have uh, gram negative. Then, of course, immunocompromised can have multiple organisms and even multiple pathogens at the same time. And then we have a group which is CLD or advanced diabetes or CKD or alcoholics, where there can be gram negative or even staph. Staph is especially common in CKD on hemodialysis. But at the same time, usual pathogens are more common even in all these four categories. The commonest pathogens are still the, the ones which infect the normal population without these diseases. But yes, the above organisms I have shown you are more common than the general population in these subsets. Then moving to the right, we have farmers and rat exposure, bird exposure and cattle and rural exposure. Farmers have a tendency to get milidiosis and they are associated with uh, dealing with cattle and staying in the rural areas so they can get Q fever caused by coxiella. Exposure to rats leads to leptospira plague and hunter pulmonary syndrome and exposure to birds can lead to psittacosis. So if we cover all these features in history taking we will get a pointer towards the organism which is causing pneumonia. I agree it is really confusing being there so many pathogens but with time with practice I'm sure you'll be able to sort it out like most of the senior intensivists or physicians can sort it out. It is not so difficult. Then this uh, is just to show you uh, that these things are not common, the, uh, uncommon, these organisms. This is a case report from Hunter Pulmonary Syndrome, which was published in IJCCM a few years back. And uh, just a few words about Hunter Pulmonary Syndrome. It is uh, transmitted from rodents to man, and uh, it is characterized by ARDS and hypotension. The ARDS occurs because of a combination of cardiogenic and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and the hypotension is because of cardiogenic shock plus a kind of septic shock in the sense there is leakage from the vasculature. And if this is recognized and treated well and you can use ribavirin, it often responds in the first 48 hours. It has a good prognosis if recognized managed properly with the use of judicious ventilation and fluids but it is a mimicker of sepsis as you can see there is ARDS, there is hypotension so one has to be aware of this the history is par paramount importance because you have to get exposure history and at the same time a very important clue is the TLC and DLC there is significant neutrophilia 
in these patients with immature cells with immature cells that is most important so please be cognizant of this uh, somewhat rare condition but we don't recognize this that is why we don't pick it up and you have to send igm hunter virus for diagnosing it and maybe a pcr can be sent if you have the facility then this is another example of a somewhat rare pneumonia called q fever pneumonia transmitted from cattle and it is caused by coxiella and here you can see there are bilateral infiltrates and uh, this patient was on meropenem and then he was started on collation nebulization but he was not responding and then the history was reviewed and it was learned this patient had visited his village two weeks ago and uh, had looked after the cattle and uh, thereafter doxycycline was started with the resolution of the infiltrates and IgM for coxiella was sent which was very high so the diagnosis was q fever due to coxiella just to give you a couple of examples of the rarer pneumonias but not so rare we don't recognize them and we miss them so the cultures were sent for this patient and uh, the blood culture and urine culture were negative so what is the relevance of urine culture here in a patient with pneumonia well sometimes uh, you can have uh, the infection from the urinary tract spreading to the lungs either in the form of bacteremia or it can be cytokine mediated which causes ARDS though ARDS is not as far as uh, terminology is concerned strictly pneumonia then urine streptococcal antigen and urine legionella antigen were again negative uh, should we send these two tests and what is their sensitivity and specificity so I have shown you the sensitivity is around 70% but if you get the test positive then it is very likely that that is the organism causing the pneumonia and the influenza PCR was negative so we stopped oseltamivir however influenza PCR can occasionally be false negative when there is a transportation problem or an inadequate sample and another thing to realize is influenza PCR if it is positive always means active infection because it is not a colonizer unlike so many other viruses so the sputum culture report was obtained and it was reported as poor quality and candida hyphae were seen so what is a good quality sputum it is one in which there are less than 10 epithelial cells per field and more than 25 neutrophils per field and that is the quality of sputum which represents the lower respiratory tract sputum other than that you cannot comment on the sputum because it represents upper respiratory tract which is heavily colonized now what is to be done with the candida it is very common to see physicians or intensivists starting fluconazole or even a higher antifungal when they see candida in the respiratory sample dear friends candida is a normal commensal of the mouth and more often than not it, respiratory samples will always have candida and candida does not go down from the respiratory tract into the lungs to cause pneumonia it is never known to occur candida pneumonia is a very very rare entity and the few cases that have been recorded are from candidemia in the blood that is invasive candidiasis so this should be borne in mind and the only indication to treat <coughs> candida in the respiratory tract sam sample is when you have heavy growth and there is evidence of bronchospasm because that can sometimes lead to tracheitis and 
some element of bronchitis and it leads to bronchospasm. Apart from that, please do not treat respiratory samples. Generally, they should not be treated with antifungals. So that is the role of sputum sample. And yes, if you get a good sample and it's showing one dominant uh, organism and that is the culture report, then definitely that should be covered with your antibiotics. However, at the same time, because certain organisms like Mycoplasma and Legionella do not really grow well on your routine sample, uh, routine culture, therefore, if there is clinical evidence of Mycoplasma or Legionella or any other organism, then that should also be covered. Because sputum sample has a variable specificity. Then one more thing about the sputum is what about the color of the sputum? So the color of the sputum is uh, not really helpful because the greenish color actually comes from neutrophil breakdown by an enzyme called myeloperoxidase and it can be seen in viral infections also. So the green color does not help much whether it's white or green. Definitely a current jelly color which I showed you in the slide indicates Klebsiella most of the times if there is no blood and uh, if there is sputum initially then uh, you, if you have a decreasing amount of sputum production that is a sign of resolution of pneumonia and if it is foul smelling that points towards anaerobic infection. Now Another thing is that only 20% of the patients can produce sputum because uh, either they cannot produce sputum or the sputum is of a poor quality. So only 20% of the patients can actually produce a proper sputum sample. So in these patients, how do you get a respiratory sample? So the answer is BAL, a bronchoscopy and uh, then you do a lavage and you get your bal. So we have to look at the recommendations as far as bal is concerned and if you see here it says it may be required in the hospitalized patient who is intubated or unable to produce an adequate sputum sample. So may be required. It has to be judged clinically and whether you do it or you do not do it depends upon your clinical diagnosis. Now as we move on with this patient, <coughs> this patient's sputum is uh, non-contributory and he has deteriorated on Pirpacillin Tazobactam. We have stopped Ozaltamavir. The PF was initially around 300 and he was on 4 liters nasal prongs but now at around 48 hours the cultures are also sterile, influenza is sterile and we put him on NIV because he has gone into worsening oxygenation and mild ARDS. So when the patient is in such a situation you have to assess whether he is responding to antibiotics or not and you look at the fever and surge markers they should respond in 48 hours and the oxygen requirement should start decreasing and procalcitonin if it is increased should start declining that is the importance of procalcitonin its kinetics and what about chest x-ray clearance? Well, this is a misconception amongst many uh, medicine students, residents and even more senior people that the x-ray should clear in pneumonia. Otherwise, the patient is not responding. Let me tell you, x-ray clearance is very variable and does not always correlate with clinical improvement. 
If your x-ray is improving, it means patient is improving. However, if the x-ray is not improving, it does not mean that the patient is not improving. It can take up to 12 weeks for the x-ray to resolve, x-ray findings. So you have to look at the oxygen requirement, the decrease in fever, the decrease in Procal, CRP, TLC, if they're elevated, that is how you judge whether the patient is responding. And of course, a subjective sense of feeling better. So now the patient is not improving. We have to look at the conditions which may be there if the patient is not improving. Is our diagnosis correct? Are we giving the correct antibiotics if it is a pneumonia? Has he developed a complication of pneumonia, primarily empyema or metastatic abscesses or meningitis or sometimes even pericarditis? Or has he got an ICU complication, maybe DVT, maybe line induced fever and so on and so forth. So at this point, when we have received the reports, the sister notices this lesion. And this lesion is called erythema multiforme. It's got a target lesion in the center surrounded by a circular ring of erythema. And this is characteristic of a certain organism. And at the same time, we notice bilirubin has gone up and the hemoglobin has dropped. And <coughs> this indicates there is ongoing hemolysis because the bili was predominantly unconjugated. So considering all this, we think of a particular organism. And I'm sure you have made the etiological diagnosis here. It is mycoplasma. This is a feature of mycoplasma, the erythema multiforme and hemolysis leading to increase in indirect bilirubin and a drop in hemoglobin. So we start azithromycin and the question here is why sh should we not give levofloxacin? So the problem with levofloxacin is one that if you have an undiagnosed pneumonia you can not always rule out tuberculosis and here you don't want to use levofloxacin which can cause resistance if it's tuberculosis as you're using it as a single drug. Then levofloxacin can cause dysglycemias. Then apart from that, levofloxacin is not good in uh, the younger age group. And uh, the advantage of uh, levofloxacin can be in those patients in whom QTC is prolonged because levofloxacin has minimal effect on increased QTC while azothromycin increases QTC significantly. So these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of azithromycin vis-a-vis levofloxacin. So we shall look at the guidelines for antibiotic prescription in the intensive care unit published in Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine around two years back. So if you look here, what should be the preferred combination therapy for CAP in ICU? And here it says cefotoxime, ciprioxone or amoxiclav plus a macrolide. So macrolide should always be added and because it covers atypical organisms, it should always be given. Then we should realize that ciprioxone and amoxiclav is good for those countries the Western world where there is very little resistance. But this is not valid for our country because there is enough resistance. So we come here and uh, if you see what are the risk factors for multidrug resistant CAP. And all patients admitted with CAP in ICU should be evaluated for risk factors for MDR organisms and antibiotic therapy should be individualized. That is the statement. Antibiotic therapy should be individualized because MDR pathogens is a very good statement 
if you consider if it was made around five six years back but now the thing is even if you don't have the risk factors for mdr there is so much resistance in the community our community here that even without mdr risk factors you are getting pathogens which are carrying the mdr genes for example carbapenem resistance in the community now without classic risk factors is around 50% so the answer here is what antibiotic should you give it should be individualized as far as beta lactams are concerned but always add azithromycin and uh, the reason why you know ceftriaxone was recommended was because most of the references which were considered came from the west and uh, because uh, we do not have such robust data on our microbiology uh, the references were taken from the west and the guidelines were based on that now pneumonia severity scores are very important for uh, assessing the need for icu admission and there are many scoring systems uh, but curb is a very easy one which i have showed you here and uh, the other one is psi so curb is something you should all know and is especially important for examinations now we come to certain key questions what is the duration of antibiotics the duration of antibiotics is again individualized as the patient responds and you are confident the patient is cured you stop the antibiotics you can take the help of procal if it was elevated initially and once it is down to 80% of its initial value then it can be used in conjunction with the clinical scenario to stop the antibiotics the role of steroids uh, there is no role of steroids as uh, per the recommendation of american thoracic society 2019 then sputum gram and culture sensitivity i have already told you and is uh, healthcare associated pneumonia terminology used anymore this is again not used anymore and these are the guidelines 2019 for sputum culture it's recommended with severe disease blood culture recommended with severe disease steroids not recommended and healthcare associated pneumonia recommended abandoning this categorization so these are the recommendations from american thoracic society 2019 now a word about the pathogenesis of pneumonia this is the commonest route we know is called micro aspiration and micro aspiration is always occurring in all of us especially when we sleep because of impaired reflexes we tend to micro aspirate now the question is if you are always micro aspirating then why should a healthy adult get pneumonia well there are two three reasons first if the aspiration is of a large volume which can happen at times second if there is a virulent organism and third is if there is any impairment of immunity during that period apart from that you can always inhale organisms such as mycoplasma which can lead to pneumonia and another way you can get pneumonia is from the blood stream it is called bacteremic spread of pneumonia and this classically occurs in the setting of a focus of infection in terms of pus formation like if you have a central line in your jugular vein and there is septic thrombophlebitis a small fragment of that septic thrombus can travel upwards 
to the right heart from the right heart into the lungs causing septic emboli or bacteric pneumonia which characteristically has a nodular appearance and is peripherally situated on the CT and may cavitate. So this particular kind of bacteremic spread and pneumonia should be recognized and apart from this it also occurs in endocarditis or can occur in a distant abscess where you can have septic thrombi traveling to the lungs. And the last mode of pathogenesis is by contiguous spread. And here what happens is that uh, there is a focus of infection surrounding the lungs. For example, after surgery, there is sub diaphragmatic collection and that infection transmits upwards into the lungs through contiguous structures. Similarly, if you have mediastinitis, it can lead to pneumonia at times or if you have a primary empyema, that can also lead to pneumonia. So this is about the pathogenesis of pneumonia. <coughs> now new research has led us to reformulate our thinking of the microbiology of the lung. Initially it was thought lungs are always sterile. But recent research has shown that the lung is not sterile just like the gut. There is a population of bacteria in the lungs that is the lung parenchyma which is primarily anaerobic but also certain other organisms and this is a healthy microbiota which prevents infection from occurring in the lungs just like the gut. But if due to any reason this microbiota of the lungs is disturbed then it predisposes to infection, pneumonia as in immune compromised patients. So the lung is not sterile and I think some of you may know this because this has been there for the last couple of years now but prior to that this was not there this concept it was thought lungs are sterile. Then the other concept is if you have ever thought whether you are breathing in any bacteria right now you are sitting listening to this are you breathing in any bacteria? Well the answer to this is yes we all breathe in around 100 bacteria or fungi or viruses per minute and these are taken care of by the immune system in the respiratory tract and this is the reason why we have colonization of the oropharynx and that is the reason why the oropharyngeal flora does change over time depending on what you are inhaling and the pictures on the right show you electron microscope pictures of different fungi and different bacteria floating around you. Now a little bit about uh, the radiology of pneumonia, x-rays only. So this is an example of lower pneumonia restricted to a lobe, classically pneumococcus. This is multilobar or bronchopneumonia, classically staph, H flu and this is called interstitial pneumonia classically by atypical organisms or viral or even early ACP and also PCP but PCP is in immunocompromised and as you can see the yellow lines mark out reticular shadows or linear shadows. You may ask why this is not bronchovascular marking. The answer is bronchovascular markings fan out in a radial distribution from the hyla towards the periphery and whenever this pattern is not there in the sense there is crisscrossing or any abnormality in this fanning out of the bronchovascular markings then these interstitial markings are considered abnormal. So what do I mean by fanning out of bronchovascular? It means they go out like this. 
from here they all go out like this this outwards in a radial fashion outwards and if you have them transgressing each other then that becomes an abnormal reticular pattern or an abnormal interstitial pattern at the same time no chest x-ray is diagnostic for any organism it is only suggestive and it has to be taken in conjunction with your other features if you are asked the question what etiology do you ascribe to the pneumonia by looking at the x-ray you can only give a broad differential but you cannot pinpoint for example interstitial pattern is classic for atypical that is mycoplasma but at the same time mycoplasma can always cause bronchial pneumonia it can always cause lower pneumonia so it is a very confusing picture and the radiology on the x-ray is not diagnostic of the etiology it is only suggestive so continuing with radiology in pneumonia so in immunocompromised patients it can be normal and it's only on ct that you may actually see the pneumonia especially in patients like febrile neutropenia then there are hidden areas on the x-ray behind the heart and behind the diaphragms and pneumonia can be hidden behind these structures then you may have worsening with iv fluids because the patient is initially dehydrated and the vasculature becomes more prominent or there may be leakage of fluid and i have already told you about clinical improvement then ct scan is not routinely indicated so if ever you have wondered when is the ct scan indicated it is not routinely indicated it is only if you are seeking specific information like whether there is an empyema or the patient is having a necrotizing pneumonia developing abscesses and so on so forth then we come to the role of thoracic ultrasound that is in the icu a very upcoming and useful modality the biggest advantage is when the patient cannot be shifted out for a ct or you need to know immediately because even a portable x ray takes time at the same time the person who is doing the thoracic ultrasonogram should be competent if you are not competent then you cannot really comment and you may be just creating confusion so competence in thoracic ultrasound is of utmost importance and uh, in the right hands a thoracic ultrasonogram is more diagnostic than a x-ray for pneumonia less than a ct but definitely more than a chest x-ray and when you are trying to diagnose pneumonia with your ultrasonography then dynamic air bronchograms are a hallmark of consolidation they may not be present that does not exclude pneumonia but if they are present it is highly suggestive at the same time you must realize that they are also not diagnostic and in certain situations especially compressive collapse you can have dynamic air bronchograms and the diagnosis of pneumonia should not be based solely on the presence or absence of dynamic air bronchograms you have to see the entire picture the entire findings and then make the diagnosis of pneumonia now what about fluids in pneumonia because the moment you give fluids is going to leak out and we all know we use a restrictive fluid strategy in pneumonia and uh, this was proven a few years ago in the fact trial and how much to give if there is hypotension as 
for the recent developments in fluid administration in patients coming with hypotension or what you may call septic shock. Uh, we are moving away from the traditional 30 mL per kg bolus and uh, you should use a small bolus of 10 mL per kg in the absence of obvious fluid losses that is vomitings or dehydration or diarrhea. And once you have given this bolus, start your NORAD early and try to get a map of 65 in most of the cases. And despite uh, this, if you have gone up on your NORAD and the patient is still not achieving a map of 65, then you should use your dynamic parameters to see whether the patient is fluid responsive and further fluid should be administered as per your fluid responsiveness and uh, you can see the reference I have put up for you this comes from Europe and uh, fluid resuscitation during early sepsis a need for individualization like I just told you then PCR multiplex on the respiratory sample is uh, upcoming technology and it is very helpful especially for viruses and these are the features of PCR multiplex the most important is that it gives the results in a few hours though it is definitely more costly but at the end of the day it gives cost effective results because it gives faster results in a matter of few hours and uh, what is the interpretation of PCR? The interpretation is that it approximates culture growth density approximately that is on your ball and uh, 10 to the power 3 colony forming units per ml or more is what is diagnostic of pneumonia on ball and less than 10 to the power 3 genome copies are not reported on your PCR and genome copies approximate colony forming units per ml on the ball and this is an approximation done by extrapolation that is not one to one but an approximate estimate. The problem with PCR multiplex in diagnosing viruses is that viruses have been found to be frequent colonizers and uh, there is no real number which can distinguish uh, colonization from active infection as of now. So one has to evaluate clinically and decide whether there is a viral pneumonia. And this here shows you uh, the pathogen detection by Biofire which is a uh, valid PCR technique it has been approved by FDA and on the left it shows you pathogen detection by traditional methods which is 37 percent as compared to 60 percent detection by biofire pneumonia panel and this is uh, what it picks up on biofire and uh, those are the viruses then it gives you the resistance genes and this is the list of bacteria including as you can see at the bottom chlamydia pneumonia, legionella and mycoplasma which are very difficult to diagnose otherwise. Earlier serology paired samples were recommended but not so anymore and again legionella was a difficult diagnosis as far as microbiology is concerned. <coughs> the problem is you cannot customize these uh, panels and uh, if you want anything else then you have to send it separately. Now a word about viral pneumonias as I told you 20% of pneumonias cap coming to the ICU is viral in etiology. Multiple reports have uh, confirmed this and this is a list of the viruses that we get in the ICU. They can all occur in patients with normal immune status of course, if your immune status is compromised, then viruses like CMV or HSV are 
much more frequent. And on the right are the antiviral drugs which have proven to be effective for these patients and uh, there are no RCTs uh, for establishing the efficacy of most of these because uh, the diagnosis of viral pneumonias has emerged only recently and that has been possible because of PCR technology because before that it was very difficult to diagnose viral pneumonias in the lab and uh, I have uh, put up a small reference in the left hand corner this is from NEGM case reports and this was a 39 year old woman with rapidly progressive respiratory failure who was diagnosed to have adenovirus on PCR and uh, adenovirus was the organism and they gave uh, sidovafir and the patient responded she was very sick on the ventilator and she was discharged though on uh, maintenance hemodialysis because she had AKI and then she had pseudofifer renal toxicity so please uh, be cognizant of uh, viral pneumonias and the antiviral drugs that are available uh, we should try and diagnose them and use these drugs because uh, many a time when we do not think of viral etiologies we think of a bacterial pneumonia and we go on upscaling our antibiotics without any response and in today's world of COVID pneumonia it would be inappropriate to not talk about it but because everybody is overwhelmed with information and uh, the workload that is associated with COVID everybody has seen enough of it so just one slide and these are the features on chest x-ray for COVID pneumonia and sometimes it can be normal and only the CT may show the pneumonia. Now the role of high flow nasal cannula as respiratory support in such patients. You know we have oxygen masks or face masks then we have uh, non-breather masks and then we have NIV and then we have high flow nasal cannula. So which one should we use? Now oxygen mask can be used if the patient is not in ARDS. But once the patient is in ARDS, NIV we all know can be used in mild ARDS and even up to PF of 150 but high flow nasal cannula has found its own place and uh, recently shown to be very effective and these are the guidelines published two months ago in intensive care medicine which says compared to cot high flow use decrease the need for intubation with a relative risk ratio of 0.85 and they have recommended the use of high flow nasal cannula. As far as high flow versus NIV is concerned they have said that recommendations cannot be made as of now because there is insufficient evidence. But in the Florali study which was published four years ago high flow nasal cannula was used successfully in those patients where NIV could not be used for example for a PF less than 150 we do not recommend NIV and in these patients in the Florali study high flow nasal cannula was used and it had moderate success. Similarly if you put the NIV and the patient is not improving in the next few hours that is again an indication to probably use high flow nasal cannula. At the same time it should be realized whether you apply NIV or high flow nasal cannula if the patient is not improving after some time then that is a indication to intubate these patients and if you continue with NIV or high flow and the patient not improving it only adds to the mortality as the patient's lungs go on deteriorating. 
so that is about intubation of pneumonia with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure on NIV or high flow nasal cannula and if at the outset the patient is in shock or in multi organ failure or is uh, in severe respiratory distress or hypercapnic or you know just clinically to be not fit for any supportive device like NIV high flow nasal cannula then you should go ahead with intubation it is probably better to intubate rather not to intubate when you are thinking that I should intubate or not intubate it is always better in those circumstances to intubate because intubation and invasive ventilation is probably beneficial in such circumstances rather than trying NIV and persisting with NIV or high flow nasal cannula. So that was the last slide and in a nutshell